Welcome to Fundamentals of Macroeconomics, Chapter 2, The Law of Demand. The demand side of the market is arguably the more important half. This is the one we all care about. The supply side, the producers, they're just a means to an end. For the purposes of this chapter, we are just going to explore a perfectly competitive market. So first we need to define what a market is. That's a place where both buyers and sellers show up, going to be at a specific place and at a specific time. So the market on the internet is different than the market at a store. Or going to the movies at night versus a matinee are different markets. To have a perfectly competitive market, we need a number of components. The goods have to be identical. There is just one price for everybody in the market. No buyer or seller is large enough that they can influence the price. Everyone just takes the price the market gives them. There are no external effects, so there's no pollution, there's no positive spillovers. And finally, there's perfect information. Both the buyer and the seller know the exact quality of the good. Now, you might be thinking, what market does this describe? Many markets are characterized by monopolies. Other markets have tremendously negative spillovers. And a used car market is often plagued with a lack of information. And other markets, they charge different prices to different consumers. The field of economics studies and has models for all of these situations. Nevertheless, with enough time, exposure, and suppliers and buyers, a sufficient component of the economy is close enough to competitive that this is a good place to start learning. Social science is difficult, and it's very rare that we find find a behavior so consistent that we're comfortable calling it a law. But here, we call this the law of demand. It states when we have a higher price, less people want to buy stuff. And when we have a lower price, there is a higher quantity. I mean, when things go on sale, people buy more. The willingness to pay is the marginal benefit at a given income level. It's another way of describing people's demand. And we can plot an entire relationship of different prices and different quantities that people are willing to pay. Let's look at Lucy. She likes ice cream. And this is her demand schedule. When the price is a dollar, she will buy five. But when the price is four, she either can't afford it or it's not worth it. We could take each one of these price and quantity pairs and put them on a graph. Notice what we've talked about before. At each marginal scoop, she assesses the particular benefit it brings. She is thinking on the margin, evaluating the effect of each small change. We ask how much you'd be willing to purchase at each price, holding everything else constant. I mean, other things matter. If you have more or less income, you could afford more or less ice cream. If there are other desserts available, or if you're full from the pizza you already ate. But before we put all that together, for now, we're going to just focus on changing the price. We even have a word for this in Latin. Holding all else equal is ceteris paribus. So you might hear some people say ceteris paribus. We've been using the word for centuries and you might hear some economists slip ceteris paribus from time to time. So let's put her demand schedule on a picture. Now remember, we're looking at a graph. What is the first thing we do when we see a graph? Identify the axes. On the vertical axis, we have the price of ice cream. And on the horizontal axis, we have quantity demanded, the number of scoops that Lucy is willing to buy for any given price. And then connect all the dots. Each dot denotes Lucy's marginal benefit of an additional scoop of ice cream. That first scoop gives her $3 of marginal benefit. That second scoop gives $2 of marginal benefit. The height of this demand curve is her willingness to pay. And notice each additional scoop yields less and less benefit. Your stomach gets full. I mean, at some point you'll start to feel sick. There are other things you could do with that money instead, such as ride a pony or play Ninja Turtles at the arcade. We call this downward slope diminishing diminishing marginal returns. The very first demand curve that was put down in print was done by the French mathematician Anton Augustin Cournot. And Cournot was doing this in 1838. As a preview, we didn't quite put supply and demand together on the same graph for another few decades. And as another piece of trivia, notice what his axes are. Remember the first time you see a graph, you gotta look at the axes? P for price is on the horizontal axis, and D for quantity demanded is on the vertical axis. Like, there, there's no strong reason which way is better to have your P's and Q's on either side of the axis. The reason today we have quantity on the horizontal and price on the vertical is just convention. It goes back to 1890 when Alfred Marshall did it that way, and we've just all been doing it that way since. Ice cream for some means ice cream for all! Markets are gonna have many buyers. How do we do this for everybody? Hilda likes ice cream too. If both Hilda and Lucy are buying from the same market, how do we combine their demands? Here's Hilda's individual demand curve. We're gonna add everybody up. This is a function that represents the quantity demanded and prices in the whole market. And same as the individual, if the price goes up, the market quantity demanded decreases. And if the price falls 
falls, everybody goes out and buys it. You can see this in the graph. Lucy's demand is the smallest, Hilda's is the second. We add them up horizontally and we get the market demand. For example, when the price equals $2 a scoop, Lucy purchases two scoops and Hilda purchases three. Two plus three equals the market quantity demanded of five. We can put this in a table or a schedule format. Some people call it the demand schedule, or if you're British, you call it the demand schedule. Lucy plus Hilda equals the market, or zero plus one equals one, one plus two equals three, two plus three equals five, and five plus four equals nine. Now that we know the basics of the demand curve, tune in next time and we'll see how people's demand changes when other things happen in the world.